Hello, beautiful people. I'm Oliver Perrin for Semiagok, joined this evening, and happy it is so, by Slavic lore, uh, Alex, uh, who is the artist formerly known as Sir Ride a Lot. And this evening, the subject of our discussion will be paganism in Russia, a subject I'm very interested in, um, mainly uh, from the perspective of looking from the outside in uh, to Russia, which is a country that we often don't get a clear glimpse into. Uh, and also, um, I'm happy to be having this discussion with Alex because he recently shifted his channel over to fo focus on Slavic lore. Uh, and this is kind of an area of overlap in the sense that I can learn a little bit more about what's going on in Russia today and some of the history of what's called uh, paganism there. I know that Alex doesn't like that word uh, pagan very much. Um, so I guess uh, without further ado, um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about paganism in Russia. I started my channel uh, several months ago because, frankly, I'm kind of cursed with being bilingual to some extent. Yes, my English isn't quite perfect, but good enough. And I look at things here on the Western side of things, and then I see things on the Russian side of things. Obviously, I'm still in, I'm, I'm in contact with many people in different uh, cities over there. I'm, I'm watching all kinds of their TV channels, and not all of their TV is government control. That's about 10% of it. Uh, Telekanal Russia is the basically main rupor, main horn of the propaganda, but there are many other very, very much alternative channels to that. YouTube is very, very, very popular in Russia. Every TV channel dumps their stream on YouTube. It's free, so why not? So they do it. Why we don't see it in the West? Well, because uh, you don't search in Cyrillic and you don't speak Russian, you don't click on that sort of thing, so you are behind, not an iron curtain, but rather a language barrier. So I figured maybe, just maybe, I'll try to poke a small, tiny, itsy bitsy, little bitty hole in that language barrier and show some stuff about Russia to the Western world, because Western world has a skewed idea of what that uh, place is. Was it um, Churchill that said that Russia is a mystery wrapped in an enigma or something along those lines? I don't remember exactly. Well, I want to unwrap that enigma a little bit, because um, it's not enigma to me, obviously. So, uh, what I will talk, what I started to talk about on my channel, my channel started as uh, politics, really, and then I realized that uh, very few people give a shit about it, and uh, it just piss, pisses me off the politics themselves. Not that people don't watch it, but what I see in the politics. I see the propaganda and the bullshit on one side, and the propaganda and bullshit on the, the other side, and then I see people believing that bullshit and worrying about it. And then when you try to tell them, guys, it's, it's not like that. What they tell you about them is wrong, and what they tell them about you is wrong as well. But they don't want to listen. So I changed my channel to uh, uh, a completely different subject. I talk about native belief systems, or rather native worldviews. reason why I don't like word paganism, well, I use it because I don't know in English of better word that describes that. Paganism is not a bunch of hippies who are dragged out on every kind of drug that there is, that they snorted and shot and absorbed rectumly and then went into the woods and ran around. I'm an elf, I'm an elf. That, that's not paganism. That's just hippies. That's 60s. Pagan is a completely different thing. Pagan is not even a religion. Although um, Abrahamic uh, religious people such as um, Jews, Christians, Muslims, it, it all comes from the Abrahamic roots, really. They see it as a religion. Pagans don't see it as a religion. Pagans see it as a worldview. You don't build a temple to it. You don't pray to it. You don't pay any tributes to it. But you use it to enrich your personal self, your, your, person, your, your own inner eye. Same way you will look at our pagan gods. Same way we look at Svarog, at, Pil at Perun, at Lada, at Svetavit, and so on and so forth. In paganism, or in the native religions, those gods are representatives of a set of ideas and representatives of the forces of nature. Their whole thing at the time was living in harmony with nature. Abrahamic religions, on the other hand, they come from the... Uh, 
uh, Hebrews or Jews in Babylon after the uh, destruction of their first temple and the uh, enslavement by the Babylonians. They were released later on, but uh, in order for them to keep their traditions and keep their beliefs, they had to codify it. That, that's the way they chose it. They chose that route, to codify it and to legalize it. And yeah, the religion of the book. Yeah, the religion of the book. This is how it's written. This is how it is. Now, in Christianity later, which, which happened, happened much, much later, it is based on, uh, it's based on Judaic writings, initially. Because if you read the First Testament, that's basically Torah is what it is. Sure. So, for many centuries, there were all kinds of Christians. Like, for instance, there were Cathars. Cathars, mm -hmm. for them, they had two gods. The bad one is the one who created everything material, and the good one, who they incidentally called Jesus, was wholly incorporeal. He did not have a body, therefore he could not be crucified because he's a pure spirit. Right, and um, by uh, the same token, you have, for example, Aryan Christianity, which I believe was much more popular in the East. And of course, the Qataris, who are essentially a dualistic religion, yes. as it's come down to us. Of course, the only records that survive are the ones that the Catholics permitted to remain. And I believe that's where the expression, kill them all, God will know their own. That's exactly uh, from, yeah, that's, yeah, that's from that. Yes. But the, so the pagans um, don't have this idea well, many of them do have the dualism in some sense or another, or have been interpreted as having that fundamental dualism. But back to your earlier point, um, they're not as much a text-based religion, which is why, for example, we have Greek temples with images of gods, but we don't have major scriptures, so exactly. to speak. I mean, that yes. very word itself, the scripture, the idea that the text is sacred. And you can also carry that along to uh, the ideas of iconoclasm, because, of course, the Jews don't have um, statues of their gods, right? That's um, contraindicated by the scripture. Right? By the same token, the Muslims don't have it, and the Christians fight over it quite often. The Protestants are essentially a different type of iconoclast that has said, remove the images, whereas the Catholic Church kept the images because it would allow them to absorb the pagan groups that they came across, because their mandate is the Catholic or universal mandate, right? Yes. So they absorb it into their, their system. So I guess what I'm hearing from you is that the Slavic religions um, are not text-based and hence have uh, the older pagan religions have another way of communicating their knowledge and their lore. Yes, this is precisely why I named my channel Slavic Lore, not Slavic History. Lore is excuse me, lore is, uh, is an oral tradition and it's very, very flexible. It changes, it evolves over time. So if you have a dogmatic religion, such as, for instance, uh, Judaism or Christianity or Islam, then uh, it would work very well as long as you um, establish a dogma and you have a society that doesn't change and then you destroy all the heresies and then it will work as a tool for controlling the people, controlling their thoughts, controlling what they do, controlling the populace and taxing them, frankly. So I, I, started to, I started to look at the very old stuff. I started to look at the very old lore, old, old traditions, the sagas, the old writings. I do uh, read from very old Russian books. I can read 13th century Russian and it's, it's on my channel. I, I read a piece of it in old, like 13th, 13, 13, 12th century Russian and then, and then translate that stuff. Uh, quite fascinating for some people, others don't give a shit about it. Uh, I wonder how many of the uh, our British friends can actually go and read 13th or so 12th century English. I can't. I don't know that language. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I start to stumble right around the time of Chaucer and what that's 14th, 14th century. So no, it changed yeah, a lot. you start going back and you need to have German and, you know, I, you know, things more like Icelandic or, you know, the Norse and the rest. And uh, the... Uh, beliefs among the different Slavic tribes, because before 10th century, there, there was no such thing as Russia. There were uh, all kinds of different Slovenian tribes. Krivici, Polanya, Drivlanya, um, Rus, uh, then uh, Ugras, which basically Finns, really. Uh, then later it was Rich Paspalita, then it was the Lithuanian um, uh, kingdom, then those lands were uh, taken by the Swedes, and the, uh, it's already after the formation of Russia. Uh, what is Western Ukraine, for example, today? It, it used to be used to be Lithuanian kingdom. It used to be uh, Swedish-controlled territory. It it was Polish-controlled territory. 
but uh, the old traditions and old gods, they are very, very, very similar among them. Some of the Slavs praised Perun as their main god. Some praised Svetavit, which is um, one of the uh, four hypostases of the sun god. The first one is Kalida, which is born on the uh, December 22nd, the early sun, uh, the baby sun in December. And then it goes for a um, quarter of the year until, uh, what's that in English? Uh, spring equinox? Yes, yeah, spring equinox. Then it turns into Yarilo which is the uh, grown-up son sort of thing, kind of like a, like a young man, is also very often depicted and used as the uh, god of fertility. So, for instance, uh, Slavs that lived by the sea, the uh, west, northwestern Slavs, for them, the main god was um, not Svantavit, it was Stri, Stribog, which is the god of the wind. It was more important for them. The top god in the whole painting was Rod. And in our language, the root of the word rod is um, rodina, motherland, raditeli, parents, rождение, birth, uh, urod, um, ugly, or degenerate, rather. And there are many, 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 many words that come from that root. And it is like that all over the place. It's like that, like that all over the language. Language did change, but not a whole lot. So kings willingly accepted um, Orthodox Christianity because they chose it. People over whom they were presiding were not so keen on it. Because for centuries and centuries and centuries they had their own tradition. So there was a whole influx of the uh, uh, Greek priests to do the God's work and to uh, eradicate every kind of um, heresy. This is, what, this is actually their writings is what we use today to figure out what that paganism was at the time. This is where we know what those gods were called. This is why we know that uh, which god was what at the time. Because they would, uh, they would go to all those temples, they would write down what the procedures were, what the um, uh, pagan rites were, what their gods were, and then they used it as a material to teach their own priests, their own converts, their own monks on how to demonize the paganism. So I follow the, um, the background. Um, I would love to hear us, if uh, possible, bring it up into the present so that we can see how these themes and aspects uh, affect people in Russia today. Okay. So, for example, you know, how much of this is out there? And, you know, would you say that you are representative of others? Are there many others like you who are looking into this lore and history? Uh, are they organized together? How does the state feel about it? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, every pagan is by definition a self-proclaimed one. Because uh, pagans do not impose their worldview on anyone else. You have to come to a realization yourself. Paganism as such is very, very big uh, as a worldview. It, it is very old, very rich. And no one on this planet can grasp it in its entirety. So you kind of... Pick the things for yourself because it is so rich and it is very flexible and it evolves. For and the, there's a, also a considerable degree of reconstruction going on. So it, everybody's oh yes. going to put the pieces together differently. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So it's renaissance. It's not as if it would be in some, say, um, a legalistic religion where you have to find some old, old, old book and say, yeah, this is how it was. So this is how it's supposed to be. In paganism, right. it is exactly the opposite way. You take the old traditions and you adopt them to the new world. And this is exactly what's going on in Russia right now on a much larger scale than I see it from what I observe pretty much anywhere else. And it's great that you brought up the point about having it not, uh, the fact that it's not based upon a text, because now we've set the stage to ask the question, if it's not a text, what is it based on? What is the, the, the basis for the reconstruction? There are several, uh, several, uh, several bases for it. Well, one of them actually is text, but that's uh, text of the Christian writings, as I mentioned before, of the uh, right, Monsko. Like or, uh, yeah, so this is sort of a snapshot in time. Second is the oral tradition. There are many, many sagas and stories and children's stories that are being told from the uh, grandma to... Uh, to your children. My grandma comes from the, uh, my grandma on the father's side, come from the town called, from a small village near the town called Yaroslavl. 
Yarilo, for those of you who know a little bit about the pagan lore, that's the sun god. Yaroslavl, well, that is the town that was praising the sun god Yarilo. Very pagan town, yes. And uh, <laughs> she told me all kinds of old legends when I was a kid. And she would tell, me, tell it to me over and over and over again. And of course, they're sort of, uh, they're very exaggerated and they sort of dummified for the little kid. They take the form of, um, of a fairy tale is what they are, really. That way they can skirt any kind of church prosecution. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive at all. Then there is a such a thing as Siberia. And... Uh, uh, in the West, I know people know, oh, I was sent to Siberia, sent to Siberia, sent to Siberia. And everybody thinks that Siberia is just snow. Well, if you go up north in Siberia, where there's permafrost, yes, it's pretty snowy. But if you go to the south, it isn't actually that bad. And you know what? There are some cities in there. So people were sent there. There were no big, big towns. But some people went there on their own. Because they did not want to be part of this whole Christian thing. They did not want to be part of these whole wars that was going on on the western border of the country all the time. They just wanted to peacefully farm and live somewhere else. So there are several different groups of people there. There are old believers, really old pagans, who some of them don't even know that uh, the World War II happened. No one told them. Well, now they know, but they did not know until very, very recently. Then there are people who are of the old Christian faith, because there was in Russian Orthodox Church, there was a schism, I think it was 15th or 16th century or so, there was like one patriarch uh, took over from the other patriarch, and they had a thing, and one of the patriarchs got burned at the stake as a heretic, and so on and so forth, so there is a schism in the Orthodox, in the Russian Orthodox Church, and those who were outlawed also... Uh, left for Siberia because they did not want to give up their old-school Christian faith. It's a very old country, so, you know, it's a thousand years under Christianity, and there was many, many years before the Christianity as well, so it's very rich in different traditions. Now, today, uh, Christian church, Christian Orthodox church in Russia is quite powerful, but not everybody follows it. First of all, there are plenty of people who don't give a shit one way or the other. They're just agnostic, or they're just plain Jane atheists. Then there are people with um, uh, spiritual inclinations who figured, well, we had a thousand-year tradition of Christianity, this is our Russian thing, our Bible is in Russian, our icons are Russian, this is part of the Russian history, our grandfathers died for this religion, so on and so forth. A thousand years is a long, long, long time for traditions to uh, form and solidify themselves. So they belong to the uh, Christian Orthodox Church, specifically Russian Christian Orthodox Church, the heirs of Byzantium. And then there are those who don't like it very much because they see what the Russian Orthodox Church has become. It become a business. You see a lot of gold. You see these um, uh, priests with big gold chains, big crosses, driving around on the golden Mercedes and so on and so forth. And they see it more of as a business sellout rather than a spiritual thing. And they want to go deep back to their roots. And there are communities that are registered officially as churches. There are several of them. They're not, they not all connected with one another. It's not something that you can just walk in and say, um, Hi, I want to be a pagan. Where do I sign up? And no, you have to be sort of invited in there uh, by someone who knows you. So they do not hunt for parishioners. They do not hunt for followers. They don't need them. They do not need to have a mass of followers as such. There are different ones. In 19, was it 1992, Alexander D., who was, uh, still is, he's still around. He is an um, ecclesiastic professor. He is the guy who studied uh, Judaism and Christianity and Hinduism and uh, Zarathustran thought and um, Islamic thought, he can quote you Quran, Bible, Torah, any of those texts, he can quote you from anywhere to anywhere. So, uh, it's, um, if you're one of those people who like to quote randomly from the Bible to um, illustrate your point, you'll have a hard time talking to that guy because he will out-talk you. That kind of guy. In 1992, he started his own church, and by 1998, he wrote a series of the holy books. He started the uh, Slaviano-Aryan Pravoslavna Cerkev. 
He registered it, he got plenty of followers and everything was fine until roughly, oh boy, 2009 or 12. Don't quote me on a date, but a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, so things went haywire. That was uh, during the, um, during the, uh, the um, election into state Duma, and because there were too many uh, foreigners coming into the country, specifically from the stands. I have to explain something because I know it, but people in the West don't know it and they will understand it incorrectly. Russia is a multinational country. So what is Russian? A Russian guy or girl can look blonde hair, blue eyes, dark hair, brown eyes. It could look uh, very mongoloid like. There are many different looks. There are many different Russian looks. It is very mixed society. But yeah, they it's all... a nation built on the bones of an empire and yeah. a really fucking big empire. Yes. So what is Russian? Russian who was born in Russia speaks Russian language, thinks in Russian, was born in there and grew up on the Russian traditions. Who is non-Russian? Somebody who does not speak Russian natively comes from another country, from another culture. And there was an influx from a Tajikistani from them. If I said it was Uzbek or Tajik, I don't remember. One of those two. And they are um, they called gastarbeiters, the guest workers. It's kind of like what we like what here in America, the Mexicans. It's like that. So they started coming in in the very very large numbers, and they would live in enclaves. They would because they don't speak Russian natively. They would kind of. Um, uh, build their own enclaves or rent all together the houses and they have their own thing in there going on. For the rest of the Russians, they don't live like that. The rest of the Russians, they all live like a bunch of Russians. And it doesn't matter if you have blue eyes and blonde hair or if you have dark eyes and dark hair. It doesn't matter if you have a big nose, small nose, if you short, tall, bald, whatever. It doesn't fucking matter. What all matters is you're Russian. That's all. That's all that matters. So when we talk about nationalism... And there was a big wave. I remember my reply to you about the Russian right, mm -hmm. uh, about the um, Alexander Belov. They call him Sasha Belly. Well, his followers uh, numbered all kinds of people. Among them were pagans and Christians. The two warring groups that don't like each other very much ended up in that whole white nationalism thing. Although it is not generally the thing for pagans. Pagans don't really care about the whole political aspect of things. They, are, they care about spiritual stuff, not political. There is a, there's a very old but, understanding. But I mean, clearly, you have a group here that does care about uh, political things because they jumped in with Belov or whatever. Some people do, but, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, but that's a minority. And. Uh, they put aside their spiritual differences to, uh, to join the so-called Russian march at the time. Because you, you could see the flags with the uh, you know, pagan symbols and you could see the uh, popes with their crosses. Normally, they at each other's throats. But <laughs> and this time, they, they weren't. This was kind of weird. So, and so you were kind of setting the stage for this guy, Alexander D., and bef before you go there, just really quickly, you mentioned that D started an organization and you just gave the name in Russian. And I was wondering if you could give us all the translation of the name of that organization he started. Slaviano Arieska Pravoslavna Church. Slaviano Arian uh, Church that praises the realm of the gods, Pravoslav. Not to be confused with Orthodox. Pravoslav is not Orthodoxy. So, because many of his followers wound up caught up with that whole thing and below because of all of that happening he got shut down interesting thing is that russian orthodox church despite the fact that they were actually priests zeke heiling in that parade they didn't get shut down yeah, russian orthodox church goes on but that particular movement has shut down so there is a persecution of uh of pagans in Russia as such. It's not like a burning at the stake sort of a prosecution, but you may end up in court and the organization might become illegal, so you have to kind of uh, come up with a different one. But yet, they do have uh, enclosed communities, they have um, their own villages, kind of like with Amish in America, that's it's sort of like that. They live off the land, they um, 
uh, make and dress in the original dress. They uh, make original tools. They have smith. They have woodworking and so on and so forth. Speaking of woodworking and smith, that another source from where they get this information. I was talking about the people who went to Siberia, and I got did I forgot to mention this chest. You know, uh, people have chests, and in those chests they have things like old writings, like old carvings, stuff like that. And uh, this is not something that they take to the museum and expose to the world. No, this is a family thing. And among those family things, uh, a lot of artifacts from a very, very, very old time. Then there are archaeological digs. Some of them are legal. Some of them are illegal. After they found Arkaim, it was a big brouhaha when they found it. Uh, the that, city. Yeah, the, the city, ancient city. Yeah, the ancient city of Arkaim. When they found it, there was... Um, there is an academic who figured out a way to uh, use the uh, aerial photographs or uh, satellite photographs to see if there are any other places like that. And he have found quite a few. And those, many of those indeed wound up being some kind of ancient, um, ancient site that v requires an archaeological dig. But there's only so much money, so much budget available to do all these archaeological digs. But unfortunately, information leaked out. So there are illegal diggings happening. And there are all kinds of artifacts being removed from those sites. And they make their way into the lore. Not necessarily uh, vetted by a professional. Right. They don't pass through academia, but uh, yes. they end up in the public aware, or not in the public, but in people's awareness. So I guess you're, and I see what you're saying. You jump back to discuss the chest in Siberia and the archaeological digs as two other examples of what provides the basis for the reconstruction. Yes, and this that whole below thing, the point I was trying to make, I should have just said that uh, in that one sentence, is that uh, while many nationalists are pagans, not every pagan is a nationalist. Copy that. That is an important thing to do. And sometimes you see them on the on the on the pictures on the photographs. Sometimes you see them as if they are Zeke Heiling on their on their on their uh, uh, pagan right. But if you watch it in motion, that's a completely different thing. It's not this Hitler Zeke Heiling thing. Right. Now we're touching on how these groups are seen by the public at large. Right. We just talked about how photographs make them out to be more like national socialists. We see that pagan groups do uh, at times ally with Christian groups when their goal is to face outsiders. Right. Someone mm -hmm. coming in from Tajikistan yes. or Kyrgyzstan or wherever it was. Right. Um, there aren't really that many people in Kyrgyzstan. So, yeah, must have been Uzbekistan or something. <laughs> what but, um, one thing that's interesting to me is that I'm hearing from you that very often you're seeing pagans and Christians together or diverging from each other, but coming together, which means they seem to be two flavors of reorienting oneself. So I kind of, the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, you know, after, uh, what's his name? Um, with the damned birthmark on his head. Gorbachev. Um, Yes. And, uh, and the whole thing of, you know, uh, opening up society and reforming uh, communism, I want to say Glasnost or Perestroika or whatever the, the specific thing was, after the disappearance of the whole communist system, it would seem that people would naturally kind of try to go back to their roots. And what I'm hearing from you is that people who move in the same circles tend to move over maybe into this more Christian camp and maybe over here into this more pagan camp. But what the two of them seem to have in common, and you tell me, is the desire to reorient themselves after this period of not having had these cultural traditions because the communists were, were of course, trying to create this brave new world. You know? Right. Some are pagans, others are Christians, but above all, the old Russians. And in Russia, there is this thing that has been there for forever and ever and ever. There's a concept of motherland and its people. And then there's a concept of government. And government is not the motherland. 
So when Napoleon went in there and said, oh, I'll free you from the serfdom, those very same serfs were kicking the Napoleon army out with uh, pitchforks and, and axes because you came to scrap with my motherland. Yeah, well, ever Not since because they of the ejected the, ever since they ejected the Mongols, the Russians don't look favorably on anyone coming in and trying to uh, dominate them. They look favorably at you if you are a foreigner and come in with good intentions. They like you a lot. It's no problem at all. It's not like they hate foreigners. So this is, I don't want people to think that. Now, if you come in, if you come in with good intentions, fine. They will meet you with bread and salt. But if you come with a sword, you will die by it. Doesn't matter how big your army is. Well, yes, <laughs> Napoleon's Grand Armée, as well as uh, Hitler's attempts, didn't, didn't do well. Yeah, uh, but yeah. now, how many, how many other kinds of pagan or esoteric organizations are there? And outside of paganism and religion in general, there were time, was time, it's kind of died out, thankfully, but there was time of these televangelist healers. It's really weird. We don't have anything like this in the West. Not, yeah, not to my knowledge. Lots of psychics and lots of people that the women go to see to get spells for work or for uh, getting their boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, you know, I have infertility. Well, take this glass of water, put it in front of the TV. I'm going to you know, energize it for you, drink it, and you're going to be fertile. And a lot of people bought that shit. And not just from, for like in the West, we have the, like you said, a televangelist, and it's kind of on the Christian foundation, right? Lay your hands on the television screen, brother, and God will see that money flows to you. Just send a check to get it, to, to get the pump moving. <laughs> it's right? like that but, minus the Jesus. That's, right, a, that's what I wanted to get it's, at. It's so exactly they, like it, only in Russian, minus the Jesus, but pretty much the same thing. You know, here it's a, sort of like a weird way of Scientology. I suppose. But, is, but well, where is the power, right? When the person gets up in the morning and decides to write a check to this person who's going to make sure that they have a baby or that they get a promotion, what is the power? Wh whence comes the power that they believe the person they're paying has? <laughs> the person that they're paying has the very good oral skills, much better than those of mine. Right. But so, so he can sell what himself. Does the person paying believe. Yes. Right? Like the person who pays the televangelist believes that the televangelist yes. will connect them with Jesus. Yes. The everyday hardworking mother who wants to have a second child or wants to find out if her husband is cheating on her and who goes to see one of these people, what do they believe is the source of the power? The power of that magician. It's that person. That's person. Yeah, that, that person who claims to be connected to some other dimension or whatever it is. They all have their own different, very unique stories. I didn't follow them too much, so I don't know much about them because I always found that's kind of weird and well, right, but, not but very interesting. The, but there is the that. Picture. So, so it is, well, it is magic, uh, but I don't want to call it Slavic magic because that kind of implies the whole um, connection to the roots and it doesn't have any connection to, to any kind right. of roots. But, but it's very interesting to me because here they will go to someone who has, I mean, some people will go to the gypsy fortune teller, quote unquote, who might actually be a gypsy because they always get into that work or often get into that work. Um, but for the most part, there will be some connection, right? If you go to somebody who's into Reiki, right, they'll lay their hands on you and the light will flow through them, right? And it's just this vague idea of the light, right? Mm -hmm. There's an energy in the universe and everything happens for a reason. Yeah, and I'm the conduit of that energy. <laughs> Fair enough. But over in uh, Russia, what I'm hearing is it's more about the personality of the individual person. And yeah. that's interesting to me because I wanted to understand the phenomena on the one hand of like Rasputin, right? Who's very much about this super fucking intense personality that comes in and kind of comes in out of the steps like some kind of crazy holy man, right? That might not be connected to anything. Uh, from what I understand, I'm no expert. But then on the other hand, and I know a little bit more about it, you have somebody like a Gurdjieff, right? Who builds his following based upon this intensity of his personality. But in Gurdjieff's case, you have him claiming to have wandered and learned from other masters, right? And so it seems to me interesting because with Russia, the individual personal magnetism 
has a lot more to do with building the brand. I mean, and it does everywhere, but here it would seem that we point to this other power that moves through us that we offer. Suppose Russians are a bit whimsical people, especially when it comes to the uh, times of turmoil and the uh, 1990s was not the best time, shall we say? It was actually quite awful time economically and uh, otherwise. A bunch of oligarchs oh, yeah. were just running uh, unchecked with the whole privatization thing. There were very, very few people who made quintillions of dollars. On all and those everybody investments. else got to die yes. drinking themselves to death in the public park and sleeping yes. under a bench. Yeah, I've seen some photo exhibits of... Uh, some of the problems from the 90s and it's like night is a dark time so today yeah. today they have in the rainy sounds this rainy sounds of the uh, coming back to their roots is not just in the uh, rock and roll you see this in their architecture you see this in their art they remembered the beginning to remember that they are russians not communist which is a very good thing they reject uh western push because um you know when i say they reject western values uh, what do they reject they reject the encroachment of this oh you must teach your children about the gay people you must teach your children about transgenderism you know you you must allow your boy or girl to choose the gender and stuff stuff like that they reject that this is for them the degenerate west but they do accept the good stuff like fender stratocaster for example or like say a bmw or i mean high tech and so on and so forth i mean there are many russians here in california that are working in high tech there are there are two percent two percent of people in california are russians 67 percent of them work in high tech biotech or in uh, sales business and finance because we all tend to have um, high degrees it's a thing you have to get an education why because you can't get anything else. Oh, and I saw when I was in Russia that the people are pretty hardcore. It's uh, in some ways, I want to be careful saying this, but in some ways it's similar to China, where the competition is so fierce that if you don't actually get good at something, you, you, just, you can't sit on your ass and say, um, I deserve something in order to eat and make your future, whether that's, you know, coming out of the army and, you know. No, uh, people who work. think, yeah, people who think that way, they, they wound up being a, a bunch of losers, I'm sorry, but it's not just in Russia, it's, uh, it's in other countries too. There, there, are, there is a group of people and they are not associated with one another one in, one, in any way, shape or form, but they are kind of all over the place. It's a, it's a human thing. They think that uh, an uncle, of some sort will come and make good you know it will be could it be uncle stalin could it be uncle adolf could it be uncle uh, uh, i don't know maybe auntie um what's your name uh, merkel or perhaps trump that he will come in and just everything is going to be wonderful he will do everything great everything for you no no you have to you have to actually work for your stuff well, I didn't get the point across entirely, but what I saw when I was there is summed up in like uh, an American who says he wants to learn to play the piano or says she wants to learn to play the violin versus someone in Russia who wants to learn to play the piano or learn to play the violin or uh, an American girl who decides she wants to go into gymnastics versus or uh, a guy who wants to go into weightlifting compared to Russia. What I saw, because I got to walk into uh, this, we were doing research on, um, on uh, exercise culture and exercise and physical fitness and stuff. And, you know, you go in and we talk to this one guy and he's like, yeah, I have to get up in the morning and go out here and do my workout. And he walks where he works out is like a kid's gym outside his apartment. And he goes and he clears the snow off in the morning and does his dips and stuff on metal that if it touches your skin, it'll tear it right because it's yeah. so cold don't lick it um, pardon don't lick it <laughs> right <laughs> and by the same token same thing with gymnasts same thing with violinists i mean there was even that crazy ass russian wrestler who did so well in the olympics and everybody said he's taking drugs and he was like fuck you come do what i do in the morning and his training was to get up in the morning and take a log on his back 
and basically walk through waste deep snow for four miles. So that's, I didn't get it across clearly, but what I was trying to say is that there is a certain seriousness about, I guess it's not all Russians because I saw photographs of one dying of alcoholism under a park bench. Yeah, but there is a whole it. level of people that they have to work their asses off. No, those who do, they, they come on top. Like, it's like the best musician, like the best actor, best, best anybody, best, best software engineer. You, it's, it's a competition. And uh, people who liked the uh, Soviet time where you don't have to compete, you can just be average and uh, you'll be taken care of by the government. You'll be one of the, uh, the rest of the poor people and everybody is equally poor as you are. That's equality. Those people want equality. This is the kind of equality they get. They're all equally poor. But they, those are the people who complain now. That, oh, we don't like all of this capitalism. It sucks. And, and aren't they the ones who always complain? Well, taking it back to, um, to the, the subject of the occult and stuff there, are there famous figures that everybody knows about? Like if we're talking about the West, we'll mention Giordano Bruno, like you did, right? Or they'll talk about John Dee, or they'll talk about uh, Aleister Crowley. You know, are there major figures in Russia that are famous for being magicians or sorcerers? Not to my knowledge. I'm not saying that there aren't any. I never actually looked at it. As far as the uh, pagan lore itself, uh, paganism has been replaced with Christianity 1,000 years ago, so anything beyond the 8th century is really a realm of um, sagas, legends, and fairy tales rather than something tangible that we can, that entire history agrees on, yeah, this is how it was. In today's day, well, let's say Sundakov and uh, this Alexander D, those two rather opposing uh, personalities who do a lot for restoration of the uh, pagan traditions, uh, I should say, in the restoration of the Russianness or Rus as such as, as a culture, the tradition of the uh, ancestors, really, they do, quite, they do quite a lot and they are well-known figures. This, they are loved by some, they are hated by some, and they are ignored by some. Hmm. And... Um... Would you say that people outside of pagan circles know about them? Kind of coming back to this question of how many people know about this, we kind of touched on this idea of people who go to um, spiritual people to have a spell cast or, you know, to, you know, they're, they're gullible people who get conned by these folks who make a living off of them, right? Um, and we know that there's, you know, paganism with rock bands and stuff. And we know that paganism and the occult is kind of, tied in some ways to nationalism but do would you say that the average russian knows much about these movements or if they do how many of them do if it's just a few is it very few you know how how widespread is this awareness in russia of these other things like paganism or magic it's on TV, it's on TV channels. Well, it's not on the uh, uh, government-controlled TV channels, that is, but it is on TV. It is, they also have um, lectures in colleges. Sundakov uh, does a lot of that. And uh, some students love him, some students just say he's a charlatan. He's a very controversial figure. He, uh, what is he presenting as his ideas? I mean, just as a summary? He is an alternative historian. He questions established history, and he questions it quite interest in, in a very interesting way. And that is why he is known, sometimes he's known as charlatan, and sometimes he's known as a, a, a brilliant historian. He has traveled a lot. He lived in all kinds of jungle. He lived with native people, who, with the tribal people. He speaks their languages. He's a very, very, very accomplished scholar. He's not just some charlatan, really. He, he isn't. He, he is an accomplished scholar. Um, actually, he looks very Mongolian, by the way, but that does not stop him from being an icon among pagans. He also has experimental archaeology place where people... Uh, there, there, is, there is a place like this, I think, somewhere in Europe where they build building a castle using the old techniques. He's got one of those things going on in Russia. He, he, they already have a whole thing built up. 
they are trying to do to run a historical experiments you know historians say it's been done this way well let's see if it actually can be done this way and then they find out yes it can oh no it cannot and this is where he asks all of these questions that established academia doesn't like because they already published a bunch of books on it they have made a name on it and now some schmack tells them that um well, uh, everything that they've been preaching for the last 40 years of their career is actually out of bullshit. That will make you unwelcome in academic circles very quickly. Yes, so therefore there will be a pushback against it. So that's, uh, that's Sundakov. He, he also runs uh, um, School of Russian Language, Old Russian Language. Thanks to him, I can read 13th and 12th century Russian. How much is it known in percentage-wise? I, I can't tell. Even if I would leave there, I wouldn't be able to tell you, because we all live in our bubbles, really. The um, Alexander D, he got his popularity because of this scandal. And uh, I think he still preaches, maybe not. He still has a rather large YouTube channel. There are many rather professionally done videos. There's all kinds of lectures of him. He published five uh, books on the uh, um, Slaviano Aryan Vede, which is very... What's the Slavian Aryan Veda? What's that religion is? That's Slavian Aryan religion. If you take a Battlestar Galactica, the last one, and mix it with Scientology, and mix it with uh, Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata, put it all in Russian setting, in Slavic setting, well, you will get Slavian Aryan Veda. And this is his version of paganism. And he's got quite a few followers. Whether he is legal or illegal at the moment in terms of uh, being a legal church, I don't know. I know that there was a big brouhaha in some 2012. When you whatever. say church, is this is not Christian. No, 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 no. And you mentioned a scandal. Maybe I missed something. Did you explain what the scandal was? Yeah, it's uh, during uh, the Russian march. Many of his followers were uh, screaming all kinds of anti-immigrant uh, ah, anti slogans. And uh, the racial prosecution in Russia, uh, racial slander is prohibited and you can't get in trouble. So this is how they get you. The government is not going to come in into your house and say, oh, you're pagan, I'm going to now put you in jail. This, this is not how it works. No, right, you have to, you have to violate you. actual law. And he, um, so that's D, and so it would seem that his paganism is associated with political, nationalistic, return to your roots kind of movements. Yeah, lots of swastikas. Um, and what about the, the other guy you mentioned? And the other is Sundakov. He is a not a priest. He is an academic, only he goes against the uh, grain of the whole established academia by questioning them perhaps too much to their liking. But he's not overtly political in the sense of... He's not political uh, at rallies. all. But he, so, he's, he participated in several movies. There's a movie, movie about Rurik, the documentary movie, historical documentary movie about Rurik. There is one about Vichy Oleg. Those are the first uh, kings of the, what had become the unified Rus at first. <coughs> he, he, he is in there as... Um, uh, advisor, I suppose, and he also does an interviews in there. He uh, travels a lot. He is invited into universities to do two-hour, three-hour lectures. So um, it's a more academic, cultural kind of thing. He's very much academic. Oh yes, yes he is. And uh, and what about? Um, do you have witches in Russia? Like I ask these questions because I noticed when I was involved in the occult or esoteric or whatever in the U.S. that there was always overlap. Right. You'd go to hang out with a bunch of pagans for a quote unquote pagan gathering. Right. And there would be like some guys who said that they were a particular type of Gnostic Christian. Right. They would go off into some esoteric interpretation of Christianity and the Demiurge and all kinds of other variants. Um, but they could be sitting at a table with someone who claimed to be into um, ritual magic and be following like the Golden Dawn system. Right. Israel Regardi and that stuff. Uh, or uh, you could be there would be a guy there who says, yes, I'm into ritual magic, too. But I don't like the Golden Dawn. I like the Ordo Templi Orientis and, and uh, Alistair Crowley, 93, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Right. And then someone else will come up and go, no, the rule of three, I am a witch. Right. And the other one would go, I, I study a Satru. Right. And yet all of these people would be sitting together 
And I saw that that was common both to uh, uh, the United States and also with Britain. And I think to some extent with Germany, the people that I had contacts back when I was with, when I was uh, involved in all of this, were basically in the UK and the US. And I heard a little bit about Western Europe. And so I wonder if it's the same. Do they have a pagan movement in Russia to where because they're a minority already, it's it's kind of like intersectional occultism. I see. Uh, problem is, we use the term pagan, and pagan is very, very broad term. So what you've described, that would be a thing of a pop culture, rather, in Russia. And what is yazychistva, or native belief system, or rather native worldview, which is also called paganism in the West, is a completely different thing. And uh, they may intersect at some point, but from what I see, from all of their countless, uh, from all of their countless YouTube videos, from all of their rituals that I see, from all the literature that I that I read on a subject, they're nowhere near. It's two completely two separate. They're not even in the they're not even on the same continent, as far as uh, um, uh, ideology goes. So you don't see, for example. Um, do, well, well, let me ask it this way. The people who are involved in paganism, do they try to practice magic? Do they try to influence events? <laughs> what, kind, what kind of paganism? What kind of paganism? As if, if this is a Slavic paganism, uh, no. If this is um, European occult kind of sort of a thing, then uh, maybe, but I don't look there. So the pagans uh, in Russia that you're aware of, they, they have no interest in it being anything other than traditions as you said, a worldview their worldview their their old religion their tra traditions of their ancestors but uh, it has nothing to do with uh, creating some kind of potion to the elect or not elect putin for example well what they about um <laughs> doing a, a spell so to speak or an incantation to a god in order to have that god give you knowledge associated with his no. her, or its realm from what I can see from their rituals, they are completely different. It is a recognition that this force of nature exists, but you don't ask anything from it. You rely on yourself. You don't rely on external power. You do not rely on gods. You do not ask God to give you this or give you that, or not give you this or give you that. You, right, so it could, you, it recognize, like you recognize that you are part of the uh, system of natural laws to which you have given uh, different spiritual names and you humanize them, if you will, and you understand their workings. It's very compatible with um, science, except that science looks at it in the realm of Yev, in the realm of where you and I live, in the realm of atoms, I suppose, and uh, mathematics and physics. And uh, Yazichistva looks at it in a spiritual way. It's a spiritual understanding of forces of nature, but they're very compatible with one another. But you do not pray for anything. And are there mysteries? As in legends, there are many. No, oh, mysteries in the sense of knowledge that a believer can gain that will fundamentally change, I, I would say, who that believer is, but it's almost more important to say what that believer is well yes if you are a christian you're a slave of the god if you're well, a pagan Christians you're a son not. of the god <laughs> they, they might not uh, see it quite the same way i'm not a christian so i don't have any problem with what you say or don't say but, well in, in um, russian orthodoxy it is and maybe in catholicism it isn't i don't know a whole lot about catholicism but when the russian orthodox christian dies in his casket there goes a, a a piece of paper from the church here goes such and such the slave of the god <laughs> well, i guess i can't say shit about that i'm sorry <laughs> there's nothing i can do about it they supply god with slaves uh, fine uh, okay believe whatever you want but uh i mean maybe catholic is going to be offended by it well i'm sorry if you're offended by it but this is just how 
uh, the Orthodox Russians do it. You die in your casket, there goes a piece of paper written by the priest who just gave you the uh, final rites and whatnot. And this he signs off on you, basically. He says, yeah, okay, I prepared him, here's your slave, off you go. Rab Boji. That's the, that's the phrase, Rab Boji, slave of the god. And by contrast, you had started to say before I cut you off, you contrasted it with what a pagan would be, a what of God? Pagan is a son of God. We are one of the gods, basically. If you're, if you're a pagan, you are a mini-god. You are mortal, yes. There are, there are those who are more powerful than you are, yes. But you can change things. You're not an ant, you know. You have your own mind, you have your own will, you have your own responsibilities, and you can do things, you can do things in nature, you can alter nature. But if you live in, um, res with respect to your gods, i.e. forces of nature and spirits of nature, then those things become sacred to you, and you treat nature as something sacred rather than something that you have to hack at with, a, with an excavator without thinking what you're doing, just for profits. That and is the difference, and that you, what this is. This is what changes you. But there is no some kind of a secret th thing that if you read this book, you suddenly become I don't know super powerful wizard or some sort. No, that's not nothing, the wizardry. Nothing like you can learn how to extend your consciousness beyond death into another incarnation, or nothing like remembering a past life. No, or there's nothing, nothing like speaking to a spirit or. No, it's nothing to do with yoga. It's nothing to do with any of that. It is understanding your place in the natural world. It is understanding that you are not a victim of some kind of original scene or something. It is understanding that you was put here as a helper to create, to, to the world creation. But you have your own responsibilities and you're responsible before yourself and you're responsible before your ancestors because your ancestors are gods. In Slavic paganism, People are sons of the gods. So if you trace the, um, the tree, your roots will end up with Rod. It will end up with Svarog and Lada and, and Rod. This is, where it, this is where it comes from in terms of beliefs. In other words, it is understanding that you are a part of this nature, not uh, something separate from it. Right, and so if your ancestors were or rather, if your ancestors are understood as gods, to you, at least, then do they continue to have consciousness? In what sense? Is it possible to communicate with your ancestors? Or is it possible for your ancestors to communicate with you in any explicit sense, other than the fact that you carry their DNA? Other than the fact that you carry their DNA, no, you can't talk to them. You, uh, your spirit will. Eventually. So your spirit does speak to your ancestors. Yeah. Well, it's a cycle. It's a cycle thing. You don't really. Uh, you you are immortal. That is, so the, 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 your body the, is mortal. You in order for be in order for, to live forever, you have to die and change appearance, and forget everything that you had in your previous life. You are not going to turn into a piece of grass. So you're not going to turn into a cow or something. You're going to be another human being, until. Uh, until you, through those cycles, until you learn enough to, for your spirit to be accepted in prayer. Okay, so it has much in common then with the Hindu. Yes, idea yes, well, very much, very much so, yes. Right, and they all come from these Indo-European roots. Yes, this is uh, where it comes from. Well, I hate to say it, but we are coming up on uh, the point where we're going to have to cut this so I can keep the clip down to a manageable size. I have very much enjoyed talking to you, so I'm sorry to... Uh, to have to bring it to a close, um, I'll, I guess I'll turn it over to you uh, to share your final thoughts on um, paganism in Russia. And also, please, uh, before you uh, wrap, also, again, tell people where they can find more of your content. Well, I suppose you could probably just post a link to my channel under this video and that will be easy for them. Otherwise, just Slavic Lore, it's one word and you'll find it on uh, YouTube or Slavic Lore, at Slavic Lore on... Um, thing that Twitter. I, Twitter, yes! That, that <laughs> stupid thing. Twitter. But I don't tweet a whole lot. The only thing that I usually tweet is that eh, is a new video. That's usually it. Well, to wrap it up, well... 
it is very different view on the uh, paganism in Russia than it is uh, here in the West. So here in the West, it's more of a kind of voodoo magic sort of a thing, if I can use this cliche saying. In Russia, it is not called paganism, first of all. I use this word because I don't know a better word in English. Actually, if any of you know a better word, please let me know. The one that others will understand, that is. Second, it is it is a native worldview. It's not even a religion, it's a worldview. And uh, it is, ties, ties them back, back to their roots. It is a long journey back into their own culture, into their own roots, into believing into oneself. Because if you don't believe yourself, nothing, no one else will. 